Scripture continues the saga of Brother Abram. As you're trying to picture Brother Abram, at about the time this story takes place, he was 75 years old. When God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, he was 99. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know well that you are a beautiful woman in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. When the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, and oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you, not, why did you say she is my sister? so that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife, take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him, and they sent him on his way with his wife and all that he had. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, church, we're continuing the series we started last week on the story of Abraham and Sarah. If you were here last week, we talked about how God called Abram and Sarai, they weren't yet and they still aren't, Abraham and Sarah, to leave the land that they were familiar with and go to a new land. And if you remember, initially God didn't even tell them where this new land was located. God simply told them, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So we talked about how God's call forced them to encounter the fear of the unknown. But through the courage that God gave to them, Abram and Sarai were able to step out in faith and courageously answer God's call. When the passage that Marvin just read for us, we're told that there was a famine in the land. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's really easy to just gloss over verse 10, which is the verse that tells us about the famine. It's easy for me to just read that and not really think about the full implications and ramifications of what that means. There was a famine. In other words, Abram and Sarai encounter a crisis. This was a big deal, and as we'll talk about in their story the crisis of the famine has life-altering consequences for them. And because of the famine, they decide to seek relief down in Egypt. And so they set out for Egypt, but right before they're about to enter in, they kind of huddle together. And Abram says to Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. He's starting out okay, isn't he? He's doing all right. Nothing wrong with what he's saying so far. Nothing wrong with giving your wife a compliment, right? But things take a turn for the worse rather quickly in this conversation. Abram says, look, because you are so beautiful, when the Egyptians see you, they're going to want to kill me, but they will let you live. So this is what I want you to do, Sarai. I want you to tell them that you are my sister so that they will spare my life and bless me. Okay, church, there is a lot to unpack in just those three verses. There, there is a, a, a lot to shake your head at in just those three verses. Now, first things first, Abram seeks to protect himself by putting Sarai in danger. He doesn't seem to trust in the promise of protection that God just gave him a few verses back. He's more interested in self-preservation at the expense of someone else. And that someone else isn't just anyone else, it's his wife. 
He's more interested in surviving rather than thriving here. He is short-sighted, and he's allowing the crisis to affect his ability to make good, sound decisions. He is allowing the crisis to affect his character rather than allowing his character to affect the crisis. The ugly truth is, this is an uncomfortable passage. It's uncomfortable because when Abram and Sarai enter into Egypt, the officials of Pharaoh see that she is beautiful and they praise her to Pharaoh. So what happens next? This time I'm not glad, you asked. Because what happens next is Sarai is taken into Pharaoh's house and she is taken as his wife. And we tend to gloss over that as well. It's easy not to really look at what is going on in this passage. And I wonder how she felt about that. What does she have to say about all of this? Well, we'll never know because we don't get the privilege of ever hearing her voice, not even one time in this passage. She is a, a silent and passive character. Oh, but don't worry about Abram. He's going to be okay. Not only is his life spared, but Pharaoh also gives him slaves and livestock. Pharaoh's inability to effectively deal with the crisis threatens to ruin everything. Like Abram and Sarai, there are times when we encounter a crisis in our lives. Have you been there, church? And unfortunately, there are times when that crisis will affect our abilities to make good decisions and we'll make some poor decisions. You know, maybe that crisis is job-related. Maybe it's health-related. Maybe it's relationship-related. Maybe it's financially related. Whatever the case may be, it is easy to allow that crisis to spill over into other areas of our lives. And that's what we're talking about in our scripture with Abram and Sarai, the crisis that they have of this food shortage spilled over into their marriage. You know, that is the danger of allowing the crisis to affect our character. You know, throughout my life, it has been all too easy for me to let a, a crisis of some kind affect my relationships, especially my relationships with those closest to me. And I think part of the reason that I do that, and maybe part of the reason you might do that, is because it's those closest to us that we find the easiest and safest places to take advantage of in some way. And it can happen at some of the weirdest times. For example, have you ever been going through a crisis of some kind in your life? And you come home from work and your spouse asks, what about chicken for dinner? Simple question. And for whatever reason, you lose it. For no good reason, you lose it. And you say, I'm sick and tired of eating chicken. All we ever do is eat chicken, chicken, and more chicken. And then you start to sound like Bubba in Forrest Gump as you name the chicken. Fried chicken, baked chicken, boiled chicken, chicken parm, chicken nuggets, and so on. All the while, your spouse is thinking, what in the world are you talking about? We haven't had chicken in two weeks. And you're like, oh, I see, so now you're a calendar too. It is easy to allow those crises to affect our lives. But going back to our scripture, God remains faithful to Abram and Sarai. God remains faithful to the promise that he has made to them. Even though Abram pretty much tries to do everything he can to ruin the promise, God remains faithful. Amen. Now, in verse 17, we're told that God afflicted Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of the situation. And what happens next is we have Pharaoh being far more righteous than Abram. You know, Pharaoh wants to know why in the world Abram has done this to him. He wants to know why Abram wasn't straight up and honest with him. Why didn't he say that Sarai was his sister? Why would he do that? And we might expect Pharaoh to go ahead and just kill both of them for all the trouble that Abram has caused. But again, he's the righteous one here. He's the one honoring God. He's the one who does the right thing by letting them live. And not only does he let them escape with their lives, but he also lets them keep everything that he has given to Abram. Even though Abram messed up the plan, 
and put the promise in jeopardy, God remained faithful. And God shows us here that even in the midst of a crisis, God is faithful and reliable. God is forgiving and resilient to our errors and mistakes. You know, the psalmist says it well in Psalm 117. It's a short psalm, but it's a mighty psalm. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Abram and Sarai are going to discover just how true those words will ring in their lives. You know, in that same way, God remains faithful to us, sisters and brothers. God remains faithful to the promise that he has made to us. And for us, that promise is found in the gifts of Jesus. And even when we, like Abram, do pretty much everything we can to try and ruin the promise, God remains faithful through Christ. Amen. Now, I mentioned earlier, I, I would like to hear Sarai's voice in our passage. I, I would like to hear what she had to say or how she responded when Abram requested her to lie and to put herself in harm's way when really he should have been the one watching out for her and, and trying to protect her. As her husband, he should have been doing everything he could to ensure their safety, not just his safety. But as we talked about, he allows that crisis to affect his character. But here's the thing, and here's the primary way that Abram could have allowed his character to affect the crisis. Had he stayed connected to God, I think things would have been really, 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 really different in the story. Had he stayed more connected to God and trusted in God's faithfulness, I don't think we'd have the same outcome. In the book of Ephesians, we read about the loving nature of Christ and how that love is to shape our relationships, especially in the midst of a crisis. And I want to start by looking at this part of it. it I think it applies to any relationship, but the section we're going to look at applies to Abram and to husbands. And we read, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, throughout the years, we, and by we I mean men, have tended to focus on verse 22 of chapter 5 there, which says, wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. And then we tend to gloss over or altogether ignore the lengthier instructions for husbands starting in verse 25. Now, men, I bring that up because I'm thankful that you are here today. Whether you are single, dating, or married, I'm thankful that you are here today because statistically speaking, we are highly absent from worship and from having a meaningful relationship with God. In most research, women comprise almost 70% of a worshiping community. So men, I'm thankful that you are here today and that you take your role as a spiritual leader seriously. Ladies, I'm thankful that you are here today and that you continue to be the backbone of the church, capital C, and for your leadership as well. It takes all of us working together to be the picture of the church that we read about in Scripture. Amen? Yeah. I want to continue with this passage from Ephesians for just a moment. I know that on my best day, on my best day, I'm probably not loving my wife the way that Christ loves the church. Now, at the same time, I'm not loaning her out the way Abram did, knock on wood, but if I'm not loving her that way on my best day, then what am I doing when I encounter a crisis? And really, this can apply to any relationship. It doesn't have to be to marriage. I think it applies to any and all relationships. If I allow the crisis to affect 
my character. It can easily pit me against those I love. I want to give an illustration of this. So Pam and Tom, if you would come up at this time, please. All right. I want you, if you'd stand up here, I want you to face each other and get into your best fighting stance. Now, don't have too much fun with this, though. Okay, so no, stay in your fighting stance. Yep, keep your dukes up, just like that. Okay, so the crisis can pit us against each other, right? It, it can affect us so that we turn our focus on those close to us. We turn our focus in the wrong way. That's what happens when the crisis affects our character. But I want to show you what happens when we let our, our character affect the crisis, because what happens then is our perspective changes, and so does our position. Now I want you to turn out and face the congregation, keeping your fighting stance. Okay, watch what happens now. Look at them. Now they are ready to take on the crisis together. They are standing side by side, fighting side by side on the same team. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Give them a hand, church. Yeah. I sprung that on them right before worship, or really during the greeting time. So thank you, guys. <laughs> church, when the crisis comes, and notice that I said when, not if, when the crisis comes, we need to trust in God's faithfulness and be ready to fight back in godly ways. So when that crisis has you up in the middle of the night, you need to tell it, okay, I've got something for you. And start reading your word. Start praying. Start journaling. Start declaring God's faithfulness in the midst of crisis. When that crisis has you believing that there's never going to be a change in your circumstances and that defeat is intimate, tell that crisis who your God is and what your God can do. And when that crisis has you ready to just throw in the towel, throw up your hands and give up, tell that crisis, greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. We got to praise God for the Lord's faithfulness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.